So it was a good time. Um, but it wasn't just around, you see, when people think about squats, the ignorant, those who are unfamiliar with the squatter movement, they didn't understand there was a broader geopolitical sentiment here. This was not just about, I want a place to live for free. This was about young and not young, black and white and women and men and straight and gay and kids and dogs and saying, you know what? We really do believe that this community is ours and we want to be part of the community. And we want to attack fundamental notions of class and gender and ownership in a multifaceted, multidisciplined way that had to do with restoring buildings and providing social services and taking care of the homeless and providing shelter for people who are HIV active. I mean, so it really was a, a revolutionary approach towards urban living. And that, more than anything else, scared the shit out of all the fucking powerful in the city. Because in those days, you had squatter movements developing in the Bronx, you had some in the Queens, you had some in Brooklyn, you had them in Manhattan. You had thousands and thousands and thousands of abandoned buildings which had not yet become gentrified and turned into dorms for white college kids, which basically has occurred now. So it really was, I've got to give the, the ruling class credit. They, they understood the long-term connotation. It really wasn't about a hundred so-called squatters living in a building for free. And they knew that if we won, their days were numbered in this city. And it was occurring at a time when there really was a revolutionary spirit on so many levels. Um, and it's also interesting because if you trace the, the roots of, of, of the squatter roots to the turn of the 20th century, this community was, was the headquarters for you know, the, the anarchist movement for Emma Goldman and for the, the feminist movement and for the Bolshevik movement and you know, the Lower East Side, give me your hungry, your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. This was the community where folks came to the United States and sort of squatting really began then. And it was a heartbeat of political resistance and political agitation um, and you can walk around this neighborhood and say, oh, Emma Goldman lived here and Masses was printed or published here and plays were put on over here. And, you know, this is where the conspiracy to, to kill the mayor was hatched. So it was a natural that the so-called squatter movement would develop out of here. And, you know, the other thing that it forced people to identify, because in those days, a number of the squats were basically for latchkey kids, throwaway kids. Kids that came from the suburbs who looked differently, who spoke differently, who acted differently, whose parents basically threw them away. They were sexually abused, physically abused. Their parents were, were, had drug problems and drinking problems. And these kids came to the streets of the Lower East Side, and they really had nowhere to go but the squats. And they developed squats, and they developed a sense of community, and they developed a sense of collegialism. And it was a great, and I don't like to call it experiment, because it's historical. Um, and it, it goes on today throughout the world. So it was, it was good, exciting. Uh, um, sometimes I walk around this neighborhood. Uh, uh, it's, it's so different now, this neighborhood. It's, 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 you know, the real estate boom took over and people got driven from Manhattan into, the, into Brooklyn. And now it's one huge dorm for NYU and other colleges in the area. And, and you have folks that, that, that don't understand the history and tradition of it. I mean, Tompkins Square Park, the fight to keep the park open that lasted a year and a half. You know, a hundred years before, there'd have been a park, the fight to keep the park open. You know, the, everyone thinks, when they think of Rent, that great play that became a movie, well, it really was about squatting, and it was about Tompkins Square Park, and it was about the battle over the fire barrels where the city led homeless people at the same time, they were raiding squats and denying people safe places to live. They were allowing them to sleep in the park at night, but extinguishing fire barrels, and people were, 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 were freezing to death. So, you know, people remember rent, but they don't remember, they don't look, they don't think beyond what rent was. Um, and it was a great time. It was, uh, you know. It was a community, it really was community organizing and community self-control at its zenith. Sure, I mean, you know, notwithstanding the, uh, uh, the arrival of Martin Luther Obama, um, and you know, the, the great answer with the, the slick guy, the, the rhetoric, it, it's clear that our age-old notions of property are dying, that the reality of the geopolitical uh, economic structure in the world in general, the United States in particular, is changing. That the notion that everyone can, you know, can just, if, 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 if you live this wonderful little middle class life and you play by the rules and you don't, you don't 
challenge core assumptions about who we are and what we are and where we're going that you'll get the piece of the rock, it's passe. It doesn't work. Uh, the notion that we will be permitted as, you know, one as 10% or 8% or 4% of the world's economy or population to control 96% of its consumption is done. You know, the king is dead, long live the king. And I think the notion of community control as we looked at it in the 90s and as has historically been looked at in other periods in this country is being revisited and reevaluated. And the notion that you know, we're all going to have, you know, we're all, we're all entitled to get our castles and the piece of the pie because our birthright is outdated and outmoded and it's no longer a viable notion. And I think we're going to see increasing reliance upon uh, collectivism on all levels. Um, you know, we had this tremendous housing boom, this burst where, you know, one day an apartment sold for 100000 then it went to a million point five in two years, and now it's down to $22,000. Um, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not even a question of people sitting around counting angels on the head of pins. This is not an academic debate anymore. This is a, a bottom line reality that the core notions behind free enterprise just don't work. The core notions behind the consumerism that has driven us for so many years just don't work. The core notions in the United States behind our arrogance that we can somehow dictate and the rest will follow um, just it doesn't work. So it's, 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 it's forcing people to reevaluate and reconsider. And when you consider the conflict between the West, which has historically you know, plundered and used and ripped and spit out the resources of the rest of the world versus the rest of the world that now is coming of age and saying, hey, wait a minute, whoa, you know, payback's a bitch. Um, it, it, I, I think we're going to enter a period of tremendous, tremendous um, uh, confrontation um, and rethinking. And I think actually in the long run it's going to be very healthy. I think now that the, even with uh, Martin Luther Obama on the throne, I think we increasingly, you know, this notion that George Bush created our problems. Well, it's comfortable and it's soft because then the notion is, well, you bring a new guy in and he's young and pretty and handsome and smart and the problems disappear is convenient. Did he facilitate it? Did he expedite it? Did he speed it up? Absolutely. But the problems that we really have are core problems that arise from who we are as a society and our voracious appetite to consume on all levels forever. Um, and Malcolm X said the chickens are coming home to roost. Uh, and I think the notion that the middle class, for, for years in this country, the middle class was vested. You play the game by the rules, your kids go to college, you get your mortgage, you get your 1.2 cars, you get your, your, your pension, life is good. It's gone. The buffer zone for true revolution, and I don't mean armed struggle in this country, I mean true revolution in thoughts and identifying who we are and where we want to go has always been the middle class because they've been invested in the status quo. The middle class is disappearing and it's no longer invested in the status quo. I think it's exciting. I don't think it's dangerous. I think it's healthy. I think it will force us to revisit, reconsider, and hopefully to grow in some pretty core and essential ways.